Uh, born and raised in New York City, Marissa is a freelance journalist currently residing uh, across the river in East Nashville. She contributes frequently to Rolling Stone, American Songwriter, Billboard, NPR, and the Nashville scene, and has had bylines in Fader, Nylon, Pitchfork, Entertainment Weekly, The Guardian, Politico, Teen Vogue, and more. She was the 2018 recipient of the Rolling Stone Chet Flippo Award for Excellence in Country Music Journalism. She has written over 15 cover stories on artists including Eric Church, Miranda Lambert, John Prine, Margot Price, Guy Clark, and Noel Gallagher. Her breakthrough story on the culture of sexual harassment in the world of country radio, uh, Inside Country Radio's Dark Secret History of Sexual Harassment and Misconduct for Rolling Stone Country is widely regarded as a touchstone in Nashville's Time's Up Reckoning. Her book, Her Country, How the Women of Country Music Became the Success They Were Never Supposed to Be, is out now on Henry Holt and Company, and it's the story of the last 20 years of country music through the lens of the careers of Marin Morris, Mickey Guyton, and Casey Musgraves, their peers and inspiration, their paths to stardom, and their battles against a deeply embedded boys club, as well as their efforts to transform the genre into an inclusive place for all. Julie Height is a music critic and journalist who's called Nashville home for the last two decades. In her audio features, essays, profiles, and trend pieces for Nashville Public Radio, NPR Music, The New York Times, and other outlets. She often interprets what's happening right here in Music City for national audiences. She published her first book, Right by Her Roots, Americana Women and Their Songs, a decade ago, and is at work on another. In 2020, she helped launch WNXP, the new public radio station in Nashville as its editorial director. Um, before I invite them up, I just wanted to say a note about the museum and our mission and how this book maybe fits into that uh, and how it came to be uh, part of this series and maybe even launch the series. It was, I guess, several months ago that Marissa had tweeted out that the book was available. If any music critics or book reviewers wanted it, they should uh, DM her. So I DM'd her and said, uh, we are neither of those things. We are a museum, uh, but we have book events uh, and lectures and we'd love to read it. It'd be nice to have it in house and, and consider it. Um, so I got the book, and I think my intention there was uh, country music history. We, we tackle country music history uh, upstairs a little bit. Um, we opened with a great exhibition on the state's music history. So that was what I was thinking. And then as I started to read the book, uh, I did not think about country music. I thought about an exhibition that had closed uh, just a few months before called Ratified Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote which was our big uh, tent bowl two gallery exhibition commemorating the 100th anniversary uh, of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, securing the right for women to vote on a federal level. And it happened right here in Tennessee, uh, up at our state capitol in 1920. Um, and that story of ratification in Tennessee has traditionally uh, hinged on the story of a young man named Harry T. Byrne uh, who changed his vote and, uh, and the casting of that vote uh, made it possible for the amendment to be ratified. And as we started to work on the exhibition, um, and so he changed his vote because his mother wrote him a letter, right? You know that story. It's a very famous story. He listened to his mother and he changed his vote. And as we started to work on ratified, we started to think, well, who was his mother? What was her story? What was her education level? How did she come to be in this position uh, of influence? We wanted to know more about her. So we started to do that and found a really fascinating woman. And then we started to look deeper uh, at a lot of women who were part of this story. Uh, and we started to thinking about women maybe who had been left out of the story. So sure, there was Susan B. Anthony and there was Sojourner Truth and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But locally, there was Catherine Kenny and Ann Dallas, Dallas Dudley and Frankie Pierce. And then of course, Ida B. Wells, well known for her civil rights work, was an important part of the suffrage movement as well. So we dug deeper. Uh, and we started to find women all throughout the state that had had a role for decades uh, in the suffrage movement and in the women history uh, movement. And that became our focus. We started to dig into those stories and it really sparked in us a renewed focus on women's history that has informed everything we've done since then, whether it's on our blog or in our programming or in our exhibitions. Um, and I realized what we were doing with Ratified uh, was putting uh, women back into the narrative of the, of the suffrage story, right? Uh, and then being a history person and an arts and culture person, I thought of 
the last track in Hamilton. Uh, at the very end, when it's who lives, who dies, who tells your story, and Eliza comes back and she says, I put myself back in the narrative. And it's a really powerful moment. So, so several things clicked for me at that moment, and I realized that what Marissa was doing uh, by writing this book was not putting uh, women back into the narrative, but documenting and bearing witness uh, to artists like Marin Morris and Mickey Guyton and Casey Musgraves, and then the Chicks as well, and Margot Price and Miranda Lambert and so many more. She was bearing witness to these women who were refusing to let themselves be left out of the narrative. So with that thought, please welcome Marissa R. Moss and Julie Haidt. Everyone, can you hear me? Is this working? All right. Hello. Comfy over there? <laughs> um, Mar Marissa, you have done such a phenomenal job at shaping the telling of this story. So um, I think, you know, I, I want everyone to be able to experience that firsthand by actually reading it, but I want us to get to, to talk about um, and get inside so much of the, of the choices that you had to make in figuring out how to tell it so effectively, you know, and to just, to spell it out, I mean, the big picture and really specific vignettes of artists that have, that have lived this out. And I, I want to start with, I wonder, you know, I, I know that, that those of us who have been on the beat where we pay attention to what's happening with, with people marginalized in country music or any other you know, space. We're very familiar with, with this reality, but you, know, you, you are writing for and speaking to all kinds of audiences, and that includes um, some who are not super tuned in to, to these realities and may just think of Dolly Parton and Shania Twain and the chicks, and it would be a revelation that there are so many things structurally in place that have been, um, that have defined the reality of, of women in the country music industry. So how did you, you know, wrap your head around um, making that reality real and doing it in a way where you were um, both giving a sense of these huge structural systems in place and also zooming in on, you know, individual experiences. Um, yeah, well, first off, thank you for being here. Um, I'm such a fan of your work, so really honored to be sitting here across from you. And thank you, well, okay, you're over there, thank you. <laughs> um, my most awkward moments. Um, but, I mean, it was hard because I wanted, um, I wanted this book to reach a lot of different people. You know, people who thought they hated country music, um, people who thought that they didn't see themselves anymore in country music and kind of gave up on it, um, people who, you know, kind of unfairly stereotyped country music, um, or people who, like you said, only really thought of Dolly Parton and Loretta Lynn, maybe, if they thought of country music. Um, but I wanted it to be really rooted in the present. Um, so I had to kind of figure out the best way to kind of do all those things within the people that I was telling the story through and the stories within that that I was kind of using to tell um, this picture. And in that process, I really wanted to bring in so many other people. So talk about the chicks, but everyone in between from Shelley Wright to, you know, Brooke Eden and Brittany Spencer, um, kind of in the now. And through Casey, Marin, and Mickey, um, they all came from Texas, and they all had sort of this similar, um, you know, within like a two-hour drive of each other, I guess. And so it was kind of a convenient way to look at this journey from sort of a equal playing field in terms of geography, general age group, they all kind of came to Nashville around the same time. Um, so it was a nice way to really highlight different ways that they'd kind of um, toyed and conquered and encountered the system along the way. 
um, and where it had worked for some of them and not worked for others. Um, so that was kind of how I came to laying things out a little bit. Yeah, and in those, in those scenes where you describe Mickey or Casey or Marin actually making the trip to Nashville, I mean, that's, that's great storytelling, but it's also symbolic. I mean, you're, you know, you're getting to, to say something about their ambition, too, that they were not just, they didn't decide to stay in Texas where they grew up and started their careers. They came to Nashville. Yeah, they all, uh, they all came to Nashville, and they all came in kind of different ways, too. And, and the one that really sticks out in that, I think, is Mickey. And that, whereas Casey and Marin kind of um, felt like there was a little bit of a cleaner path to kind of, you know, things came to a logical end in Texas, and then they moved to Nashville. Mickey moved to L.A. first because she thought that she was never going to really have a shot at country music anyway, so, you know, maybe try out acting or, you know, something else that she might have a little bit more of an open door, um, even if it's like a tiny crack. Um, so her path was a lot, you know, not quite as direct. And again, sort of having that story of them coming from the same general geographic place, like really allowed me to highlight, I think, those disparities. Whereas if things were, you know, incredibly hard for Marin and Casey, it was like a whole other level for Mickey. And, and maybe we should take a step back and, and contend with what you contend with in the book, how you make these realities feel so real. I mean, you are not just in some abstract way referring to gender inequality, you know, um, as, as some just abstract or amorphous force that exists. I mean, you're, you're pinpointing really specific things programming philosophies and actual numbers and hard facts and things that show, um, you know, hard, specific, systemic um, realities that, that these artists were up against. So what were the most striking things to you? I mean, obviously you'd done, you'd, you'd researched the subject before writing the book. You did that, you know, really important piece on what women face in the country radio tour, but what did you feel like were the most striking and telling and revealing things that you could illuminate? Um, I mean, I think there were a lot of things that I came up upon that are only, like you, being in Nashville, you hear, you hear sort of, I guess, urban legends or things that are sort of accepted as fact all the time, and, and you're never quite sure how it's gonna bear out until you report them out. And whether it's, you know, the don't play women back to back rule or one women an hour or, um, you know, any number of sort of things that you hear is kind of commonplace in the culture. And then you report them out and you realize that there's actual facts to back up those beliefs or those myths or whatever they are. And, um, you know, I found actual programming manuals that said there, you know, right in the text, like, we don't play women. You have a copy. Back. You have a. I have a PDF copy? from a um, from a programming consult, a radio consultant, and he put it there in words and you know on the internet, um, and then bragged about how this manual had been downloaded and purchased by you know three thousand different <laughs> or something kind of crazy, um, but it's right there you know for you to see in, in front of your eyes. And uh, it never stopped being surprising when you see those things. Um, but I think even when I was doing a lot of, ver I became really interested in what happened around kind of 1999 to like 2004, sort of in, you know, leaning into 9-11. Um, and then what happened with the chicks. And I always sort of had this idea or this hunch that like maybe what happened with them and speaking out about the war in Iraq would have happened eventually if it wasn't that, that their expulsion or some kind of like, a, you know, desire to check them would have happened at some point. And I really kind of found that to be true in my reporting. And I went to the Country Music Hall of Fame and I was pulling out Country Weeklies or Country Music Magazine or whatever it was from around that time period. And because it was COVID, I couldn't go into the stacks and like pull out the specific dates by myself. I just had to say, like, give me this whole range of years or 
something like that. So um, someone had pulled a bunch for me and they weren't in order and I was flipping through one of them and I saw this really crazy graphic of Natalie Maines where she has a huge mouth and she's painted to look like a big cartoon villain. And uh, I took a picture with my phone and then I went to kind of log it because I thought, oh, this must be from like, you know, somewhere in 2003 and it turned out it was from like a year and a half before that incident ever happened. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because it was like oh, this sentiment was building. Perception was yeah. already in play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I wonder. I mean, you're, that era that you're talking about, that you write about, um, was sort of a, a golden period or one of the heydays of of women in in mainstream country from the late '90s to the early 2000s. I mean, we've been throwing out some artist names that really were very prominent on the charts and and well beyond the charts. I mean, in in popular culture and on some of the biggest tours and that kind of thing around that time. Um, Shania Twain and the Chicks and Faith Hill and, and many others. And, and I wonder, you know, because you, you also reference much earlier generations of, of women and other, you know, experiences that they had and cycles and patterns and things and things like that when you began to wade into and, and think about, you know, here is this moment I'm trying to make sense of and in light of what happened before it and before it, um, what you began to take note of when it, when it comes to, you know, how the story has been told and what, what's been left out, who's been left out, who's been lifted up and who's been, um, you know, and, and how um, how things get flattened, that kind of thing. Yeah, how did you how did you start to think about that? Um, I think that was something that was really kind of heavy on my mind in terms of how I told the story in the book, but even kind of who I wanted to feature to eliminate that from happening again, kind of in the next twenty years. Uh, I thought a lot about kind of how someone would reflect on this past 20 year period and who they would think of as being, you know, the stars, who they would think of when they thought of country music in the past 20 years. And I know who I think of, but someone else might think of Luke Bryan and Jason Aldean and maybe Carrie Underwood. And if that's fine if that's your version of it, but there's a much broader picture um, that exists. and. Um, I kind of wanted to make sure that that was what the book was doing, even as I kind of mined through history and, and, and rethought what sort of stories were missing. And I did that a lot through, I think, not just talking to artists, but talking to people in the industry. That was kind of even more often than not kind of where, um, you know, led me down really important wormholes, I guess. You know, there would having a conversation with someone about the chicks or about, um, you know, Miranda, and they'd be like, yeah, like, this, this thing happened, but do you remember this person? Everybody forgot about that, or we don't talk about her anymore, or we don't talk about the impact of this, and those were the moments where I kind of like, you know, a little, your little flag goes up, you know? It's very appropriate to be considering this in the context of the Tennessee State Museum, <laughs> where historical narratives are put on display and interpreted and made tangible, you know, and, and I can feel that, I can feel that the impulse, you know, rose, presented itself to you to set the record straight, you know, it, at so many points in the book. And I mean, even when you, you bring up Leanne Rhymes multiple times, and that really struck me as because, you know, I mean, you, you um, point out that Leanne Rhymes was, was an influence on the very young Casey Musgraves and the very young Maren Morris and the very young Mickey Guyton. But you also, you know, talk about her erasure from, um, from memory and from like a sense of who's considered important or even remembered, you know? I mean, what, was, that, was that a moment of, you know, wanting to set the record straight for you? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you asked about Leanne. And um, I think the fact that 
you know, that popped out to you shows that you, um, or I guess the fact that a lot of people don't, haven't asked me about it over the course of the past two months maybe shows that how much we kind of have forgotten about her a little bit. And um, that, her story had just kept coming back to Leanne Rhymes when I talked to Casey and when I talked to Marin and I talked to Mickey and I just kind of mined through the ways that they've talked about their career. And, uh, and I remember her from growing up and her voice always stuck with me. And I always kind of, that was one of those ones like with the chicks where it's like, where did she go? I don't understand what happened. Like wanting to understand how someone could be so influential so talented, and then so sort of seemingly disposed of. Um, and so I did kind of- right there. I know. For real. Um, <laughs> I did have kind of a, a list almost in mind. Um, I did have a list in mind of women beyond those three where I really wanted to kind of, you know, reclaim and set the record straight on. And Leanne was kind of at the top of that list. And even though, you know, you're not necessarily using the language or the literal word agency when you write about Casey and Marin and Mickey, I mean, it, it struck me that that, that is, in fact, th those are the stories that you were telling about those artists, about how they exercised their agency in the ways that they moved through, in and through and around obstructions in the industry. So, I mean, when you, when you think about that or when you were thinking about it and working through, I mean, I'm sure there was, you know, this, this book could have been five times as long. You had, to, you had to leave some things out. But what did you find to be kind of the most striking or pivotal examples of each of those three artists using their agency? Um. I mean, I think I always go back to Casey at the very beginning of her career um, when she was so insistent on releasing Merry Go Round as for her first single. Um, that to me is such an interesting moment because she, she had built a lot of, you know, she had built some momentum in town as a songwriter and, uh, you know, a good little base. And, uh, she could have made such a different decision in that moment that would have started off her career probably with a number one on country radio if she wanted to, maybe, who knows, probably not. Of course not, never mind. Um, <laughs> but at an least, alternate like, reality yeah, in at a sci-fi like, movie. Yeah, at least made a, you know, a much more, um, a bigger go at, the, at that kind of goal and that kind of career. And releasing a song like that as your first, you know, your, debut into the country world is, um, it's really bold, you know, especially in the time period that it came out. And Oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was not the time for, you know, reflective, uh, you know, critical takes on, on small town life. And uh, it was time for the party, you know. Disillusionment. Yeah. <laughs> Disillusionment delivered in the most casual tone. Yeah. And, uh, that to me, I think, is a really important moment. I think that a lot of artists look at now and say, you know, if she can do it, then I can do that too. And whatever that leads to, nobody really knows anymore, but at least you're sticking to your artistic vision. Yeah, absolutely. Are there, are there examples that stand out to you as much um, in the case of, of Mickey or Marin? Too. I mean, the timelines would be different, obviously, but... Yeah, I mean, for, for Marin, I, she's made a lot of really interesting choices. Uh, I'm really fascinating, fascinated by Marin, as I am about all these women, which is, I guess, good, because I wrote a book on them, and you want to be fascinated by them. <laughs> People are going to be asking you about them yeah. for the rest of your career. Yeah. It's convenient <laughs> to be interested in that. Um, but... Marin, for me, made a lot of really interesting choices, but the one that I kind of became most fascinated with, I guess, was she, you know, had a lot of success on her debut album, and then she had a lot of success on her second album, too. And 
she then had the song, this pop smash, the middle with Zed. And she could have taken that and I think pivoted to be a massive pop star if that's what she wanted. Um, and she didn't, you know, she could have after the middle then gone and like recorded a whole other album with Zed and, you know, done that whole pop thing. I, you know, I think she could have done that or at least tried it. And what she did next was join the high women and show up at Newport Folk Festival in a pair of cutoff shorts, you know, and that's, uh, that's so interesting to me. You know, in one moment, she, she's in so many different worlds and in one moment she's, you know, singing the middle on stage and, and being full pop and then not long after she's showing up at the Americana Awards and she's singing backup. You know, she's not, I mean, not backup, but she's not even, she doesn't even have a verse and, um, on the song that they, you know, the high women sing there. And that's so interesting to me and so kind of uh, unusual and unprecedented for her. And, uh, and Mickey, I think, is more, I mean, Mickey's just kind of perseverance and dedication to being in country music, despite repeatedly being kicked down again and again and again. But I mean, she talks about this moment where she sat down with her husband and was like, you know, why isn't this working for me in country music anymore? And her husband said, it's because you're running away, running away from everything that makes you different. And I mean, if that's not something that everyone you know, can kind of take to apply to their own lives too, but especially Mickey's experience, and it just kind of led her down this whole other path in terms of really singing her truth and, and just kind of doing you know, what worked for her and what told her story. And I saw her perform a song, What Are You Gonna Tell Her at the CRS Award, that's at CRS, not the awards. Um, it was actually right before the pandemic. And, uh, it was a really interesting experience because she just, she sounded incredible and the story was, you know, she's singing the song about, you know, what are you gonna tell your little girl in a room of like 90% middle-aged white men that are like eating chips super loud and like don't give a shit, you know? And, uh, or <laughs> pretend that they do. <laughs> and, uh, but she sang that song anyway, you know, and she knew, you know, it wasn't going to be released as a single. None of them were going to play it. And she stood up and she sang that song because she thought, you know, it needed to be heard. And uh, that was really powerful. And, you know, when you, when you write about Mickey, you know, there, there's so many things that she has said, has begun to share, realities that she was already living, but has begun to share that illuminated, um, pressure and parameters placed on, on her to, you know, prove that she belonged, that she was a real country artist because she's a black woman and those kinds of things. And then, and you also pointed to how Natalie Maines was, you know, portrayed in media. There, there's so many um, examples in the book of double standards, um, things that are, things that apply to, that apply one way to straight cis white men, um, in, in the country space and then apply very differently to anyone else trying to, to work in that, in that space. I mean, were there particular, particularly um, telling instances or examples that you came upon that you felt like really just showed the reality of what, of what people are up against? Yeah, I mean, so many, it's probably hard to think of specific ones even, but um, I mean, kind of exactly what you said about, about Mickey, I think of an article I saw this morning in The Federalist, I guess an article is probably a generous word for what <laughs> I read, but um, she's performing at a July 4th celebration on PBS this weekend, and The Federalist word vomit thing on the internet was about how this was like, <laughs> you know, um, you know, a disgrace against soldiers, like because she has a song called Black Like Me that they claim that she wrote after George Floyd was murdered, which isn't even actually true, but that's beside the point anyway. There are black soldiers? Yeah, I mean, there you go, another question. But um, it was just, you know, this is an assault to our servicemen, our country, and, um, and that's just one of many 
hundreds of reactions that she gets like that, that she is not authentic country enough. And, and I found a lot of, I found articles in one, uh, one in specifically a, uh, a country music blog dedicated to preserving, I don't know, I don't want to say the name, <laughs> a blog about country music that claims to um, preserve the integrity of it. Hmm. And uh, from, I, I, know the one you're I think you about. might know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was talking about Mickey's single in 2015, I think it was. Um, and it was describing Mickey as a combin like a great combination of um, country music and R&B and hip hop or something like that. I want to misquote it, um, but it was wrong. You know, it was like, it was just saying, like, why are you throwing in R&B and hip hop? Well, we know why, you know. Uh, this is a pop country song. It, it, you know, could live with Carrie Underwood. It, it, it doesn't, you know, it's not an R&B song. You're just saying that because she's a black woman. And, um, and she still repeatedly has to prove that kind of country cred over and over and over again. I mean, she told me a story about how when she was meeting with record labels, they were, like, quizzing her on country music as if, uh, you know, as if she didn't know who Clint Black or Pam Tillis was or something like that. Um, which I really highly doubt anyone else, you know, a, a cis white male or maybe even, probably even female has to deal with when they go into record levels. You, you write in, in your conclusion that you can't get enough of rule breakers. And I think it's, I think it's worth noting that in different genres, different industries, different spaces, different scenes, different cities. Um, rebellion doesn't always take the same form. The way people define that is not necessarily the same in indie rock, in SoundCloud rap, in, you know, um, in, even in mainstream pop. So um, you had to think about so many different examples of that in the, in the writing of this book. What, what counts as rebellion for country artists? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that was a learning process for me, even, like, as I came to Nashville as someone that loved, like, had started to really fall in love with country music, and I came in a, in a weird way, you know, I grew up in New York, I, um, I didn't have a country upbringing, I grew up in a tiny apartment with, you know, with no car, I didn't listen to country radio, <laughs> so, uh, except for uh, the one instance when I shuffled back and forth between my divorced parents' house and my dad played country radio. That was the only time I heard it. And I, love the, I love the stories about you hanging out with the horses with your dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I guess I had this like alternate country upbringing. My dad lived in Texas. And, um, but I was, you know, I don't pretend to like really have love country music in that moment. But I really, you know, kind of just got in there, you know, when I wasn't paying attention, I guess. Um, but my, I say, like, my dad has the last laugh on that one, I guess, you know, playing all that country radio. Um, he really loves Shania, so <laughs> men like to listen to women. Um, but, yeah, I had always been fascinated with, I think as a lot of teenagers are, are teenagers are rebellion and, like, how that's expressed through music. And I think that's kind of how I found myself. Um, and for a while it was through... Um, you know, Ani DeFranco and uh, Fiona Apple and... The angsty singer The angsty singer-songwriters of the 90s. That was kind of a lot of my life. And, uh, and I think I see a lot of that in these women in country music, too, in just a different version. But as you said, like, rebellion, it, you know, it looks different in country music. It means something different, um, but that doesn't make it any less valid or important, you know? Um, and I think that was something that I wanted to try to change people's minds about, too. I think, like, there's sort of only one acceptable outlaw version <laughs> in, like, of what you can be. And I would say that, I would say that Mickey Guyton's an outlaw. I would say that Mara Morris is an outlaw, whatever that kind of really weird term means. Um, but if, you know, if you're talking about what outlaw country is, it's, it's not like, you know, wearing a cowboy hat and like getting on a or whatever like you would see when you're trying to like advertise a you know a, a 
some kind of new soft drink called Outlaw Pop or whatever, I don't know. Um, but it can look very different, you know. Being an outlaw just means doing what's true to you against the odds and against the system, and these women do that. Tanya Tucker is my idea of an outlaw. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got uh, one last question for you, then we'll see if anybody, anybody has uh, questions to throw in, too. I wonder if, you know, at the end of, of the experience of writing the book, thinking so much about just dynamics between artists operating in the industry, um, trying to get somewhere with country radio, all of that friction, all of that tension, you know, everything they were coming up against. Um, you know, there are other scenes where you talk uh, a little bit about, it's not a fan-focused or audience-focused book, but you talk about show scenes and people who are actually real human beings in the crowd. Did you begin to think about, um, you know, what the difference is or what the divide is between the industry um, and the radio world and the real, you know, live audiences that are out there connecting with the music? I think I thought about that a lot, for sure. And, and even sometimes that exists within, like there is a, a divide between the industry and the audience in that way, but sometimes there's even a divide within the industry in terms of like their industry selves and their real selves. And like, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I even see that by like when I'll, you know, I'll tweet something or I'll write something it's maybe a little bit, um, you know, provocative. Provocative, thank you. And I'll get a lot. I'll get texts kind of cheering me on from certain people in the industry, being like, "Good for you! Like, glad you wrote that. Totally agree." But no one will say it in public, you know. So there's, you know, they're not going to their social media or whatever to call this out. They're just glad that other people are doing it. I guess. <laughs> um, you know, they'll like whisper in your ear that they voted for Obama and that's supposed to mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, and I think I, it's, it's a cool process finding country music fans and, and really seeing fans out there that um, don't fall into whatever sort of survey demographics that people think exist. And I mean, there is a certain kind of country fan that um, I'm trying to avoid saying his name, but like listens to to certain country artists who um, you know might be more conservative in. I don't even want to use that word because it's fine to be conservative. It's not fine to use racial slurs. Um, so there are certain you know sectors of the country audience who will defend people like that and. That, that is out there. But there is also a whole other kind of country audience that exists that, um, that listens to Casey Musgraves and Maren Morris and, and lives in all kinds of different places and, um, and identifies in all, com as, you know, in all kinds of different ways. And, and those country fans are out there and I've spoken to them and I know that they exist. They're real human beings. Um, and if you even sort of take away the, the morality of it, like, why wouldn't you want to tap into those fans? I mean, if money is what makes music grow, go around, like, <laughs> those fans are money. You know, you can, uh, so it has to be some sort of intentional choice to either not see them or not want to include them or reach them. You know, not to sound conspiracy theorist, but. Well, the, the great thing about being here is that people don't have to DM you on Twitter. We can just ask you a question to your face right now, if anyone has one. There's a mic that can come to you. I have a question. And I, I have not read the book yet. Do you address in the book what the economic payoff is for it? Because you have this guy who's written this PDF that states, don't play country music, women only once an hour, et cetera. 
And if we know from the public and we know generally in Nashville how the industry works, what is the economic payoff? Because to me, it's not conspiracy theorist. I mean, no matter what you do, it's about money. And so what is the, I still have a hard time figuring out. Because even as a, I'm a, a side player, and even from the side player standpoint, there are a lot of those women who don't hire women in their bands. And there's specific reasons for that. And there's a lot of backroom conversations that happen around that. And I just keep wondering, what is, what is the monetary, if there is one, if it's just, it can't just be pure prejudice, you know, that keeps that cycle running. So I don't know if you speak to that or. Yeah, I mean, um, there's probably some pure prejudice that exists. <laughs> um, but I mean, we have, we have built a system so the, the logic goes that, you know, women don't want to hear women or women's voices. Um, you know, if you look at radio testing, don't test as well. And if you really break that down, there's some truth to it at the surface level because you have to hear something on the radio to want to hear it more. So we've built this, we built this system where we have created we have made women's voices somewhat undesirable because we don't play them a lot. It's not like people are born liking to hear, you know, preferring men or women or as if any of that really matters. But we've, we play so many men on the radio that women's voices are not familiar. And radio is all about familiarity. So when they do this testing of people that are already, um, already country radio listeners, so they already come in with a bit of a bias anyway. Um, and you play them songs that sound super familiar, of course they're gonna like the Luke Bryan and the Jason Aldean and the Luke Jason, whoever is Luke or Jason that week. Um, they'll like them because that's what they're used to hearing. You know, that kind of, that voice tone, that sound, that tempo, that's familiar to them. That and then you- in the back of the throat from yeah. Luke Bryan. <laughs> Um, and he's fine. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, I like a lot of, it's a silly caveat to say, like, I like men's music too. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, that's just, fair. Yeah. That's fair because it illuminates how ridiculous it is that I yeah. don't have to say, I like women's music yeah. as though that's a discrete category. <laughs> yeah, I love the category of men's tunes. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, we've created a world where women's voices are unfamiliar. Um, so when you do this testing, they are getting that feedback. And I don't know how long it would take to break out of that, but probably not too long. You know, like, you know, you have like a couple, I mean, I'm not any expert on this exact how this data system works, but you take a couple weeks and you bring in a couple new voices and you start to change that familiarity. It doesn't take much, you know, but you just have to try it. and. The way that they pepper in women's songs on radio now is a lot of times in overnights. So they, this is how all the data is completely skewed. So they take a new song by a new artist, say, Lindsay L, and they'll play it uh, between the hours of like midnight and four. And they'll say, well, we played this women, woman's song and it's not, it's not testing well. Okay, well, you played it between 12 and four. So like no one heard it. No one truckers got to know it. it. Yeah, truckers heard it, but they already are listening to Luke Bryan and Jason Aldean, so you're not, you're not gonna sway them. You need to play that you know, during morning drive and school pickup and, and all those other times for people to actually hear it and start to like it and start to become familiar. And then it drops out of overnights because it's not testing. So there's a lot of like kind of layers to how broken the system is, um, which is really depressing. But, um, you know, the more, that's why, like, you can't, a lot of people will say, like, oh, why do you, like, keep caring about country radio? Um, and to some degree, I'm very pessimistic about it and definitely have given up uh, a little bit, but there is potential to change. It's, change, it's changeable, you know? It can be changed. We're just choosing not to. This is a good follow-up question to that. So there are, there are two moments that I think happen later in the book. Uh, there's Marin Morris releasing My Church on Spotify, and it, and it explodes, and it's huge. Uh, she goes around country radio, 
music row takes notice, everybody takes notice, right? Um, and that's a really powerful moment, and you think, oh, the digital revolution has caught up with country radio. It's out. Uh, but then the high women decide to do that, I guess it's at Studio A, maybe, they decide to do that event where they um, perform for, and I think they all think, this is, there's no reason to do this, this isn't gonna help anything, but they put their all into it. it it's a great performance, nobody picks up the record, it doesn't get, and, and those two things juxtapose, make me wonder, um, I think they feel like country radio still matters and they have hope and they think, gosh, this is still a way to reach America and they do it anyway. Um, so I wonder if, if country radio, if it does still matter, if there's in the last 10 years, um, why, why is it still so important? Why, do they, why this effort to still try when you could go the digital route, I guess? I mean, there's like one in Nashville, in country music, there is, you know, the shortest route to um, success and, and market share in the country music industry is country radio airplay. Um, and that's not, a, you know, I think that's a weird thing to say to someone who's like, you know, in their late teens and early 20s who listens to pop music. Like, they don't understand, like, why you, you know, give a shit about country radio. Um, but here it really is. It is, you know, the factor for, you, know, you get played on country radio and you're going to get headlining spots at, you know, at the festivals and, the, and all of that. And um, I was just looking at a festival of five, uh, it had five headliners um, and they were all white men, all five of them. And that's standard, you know, and that's because those are the guys that are getting played on country radio. They're not necessarily the guys with the biggest audience. Um, I mean, Luke Bryan, Luke Combs, and Jason Aldean, they have big audiences that are, you know, they've grown themselves, I guess. But there are a lot of dudes that you can find that get played on country radio that could not sell out, um, you know, a, a fairly small club. The Ryman. The yeah, Ryman. they could not sell out the Ryman. And, you know, I always point to, like, Margot Price, who sold out three nights at the Ryman, or... You don't have to just talk about women here. Tyler Childers, Sergio Simpson, Jason Isbell, um, Casey Musgraves, obviously. All of these people um, aren't getting played on country radio, but they have huge fan bases. Whereas, you know, do, do a lot of people know who Dylan Scott is? You know, how big is Dylan Scott's audience when he plays? But he had a number one song, or maybe two? I don't, I don't know. Um, but we build up these men to have number one songs and um and a lot of time it's not even like you know there's some wheeling and dealing and all of that and it's just sort of the conveyor belt that gets them there um while casey's you know selling out bridgestone arena um and there are you know there are ways to success through streaming obviously um and I think that's really important for artists to be able to access. They should pay artists more. I always like to put that little caveat in there in terms of DSPs. But um, if you want to have a mainstream country career and be played on country radio, that should be available to you. It shouldn't have to be like, I, I can't do this because I'm a woman or because I'm a black woman or because I'm queer. I can't have this. I have to do something else. If that's what you dreamed of, and that's what you want, you should be able to have that available. Um, yeah, so that's why, you know, it's still just as important. I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to fully articulate what's <laughs> rolling around in here, but um, I'm thinking of Casey Musgraves and Maren Morris and Taylor Swift and these women that have had um, genre shifts, like they've moved away from country, I would imagine, because that's artistically how they feel like pursuing a new path, but they are moving away from country and adopting these larger audiences in contemporary music and, um, and kind of shifting their their vision in that direction where you know when you think at least i don't i'm not well versed enough in the history of country music to to speak to this anything other than anecdotally but i think of like 
Garth Brooks, who tried to do his Chris Gaines thing, and then... Um, we don't talk about that. that <laughs> we don't talk about that. We don't talk about how you were talking low-key, referencing Morgan Wallen. Um, but um, also, or like Tim McGraw did an album years ago that Alison Krauss produced. It was a total flop. You know, like people, it seems as if, I, I'm doing that thing in the New Yorker magazine where they have the thing that's like, this is just a statement that's not ever a question. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I swear I'm getting somewhere. Um, but that people don't like when women change their genre or their artistic direction. And it seems like with men in country music, you don't see that happening very often. Like Luke Bryan has not changed his direction. Like he is still making trucks, summer, boats, beer, shorts, songs. Um, and so I wonder if there, if you have any academic expertise or um, reportage from your career that speaks to that, um, people wanting men's country to stay the same and then abandoning women as country artists when they shift genres. I mean, I even, um, yeah, all that is, is very true. But I even do think that if Luke Bryan next month put out a terrible rap album or something or whatever he did, I think he would be fine. You know, I think we would, okay, like that's, you know, good job, Luke Bryan and then go back to normal business. You know, it wouldn't like impact his countryness. That would just be Luke Bryan's weird album and then we'd all go back to, you know, the shorts and truck songs, um, like nothing ever happened. And for women, I mean, Maren Morris wrote this really interesting piece for Lenny Letter, it was Leah Dunham's old, um, I guess, newsletter. And she talked about kind of her relationship with how much she loved country music, but it often doesn't love women back. But then when women try to venture outside of it, and you know, it's not like you, it's not like these artists are sitting down and saying, "I'm gonna, you know, make this different genre category of music." You know, like no, I don't think anyone is being that. You just make music, and you then you figure out what how it's marketed later, right? You know, but um, if you try to find people that actually appreciate might appreciate your point of view or what you're singing about and that happens to be in a pop audience and you're interested in playing with those landscapes or whatever. Um, and country music isn't accepting you, but then women are punished for it. That's the thing that happens. It's like country music isn't, country radio won't play women um, even if they're super country or if they're not super country, it doesn't really matter. Like however you fall on that scale, it doesn't matter. Um, but then you venture outside and then you're punished for it. So it's like kind of a no win. You know, you can't, um, well, you know, why wouldn't you think about kind of leaving something that doesn't appreciate you? Or at least like, you know, playing in new waters, like where, where people might hear what you're saying in a more authentic way, I guess. Um, but you see it all the time, you know, with everyone from, Marin to Taylor, um, but men, I mean, are making songs on country radio that are not country at all right now. They're pop songs, um, and we don't really, we just let that continue to happen, kind of. <laughs> um, and I personally don't really, I, I don't care too much about like genre purity stuff. I don't like find that to be that interesting. I like tradition. That I find interesting. Um, but we only really seem to be super worried about it when it comes to women. You know, and men can kind of do whatever they want. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you, you do talk a lot about the models of authenticity in the book and how those have been applied differently to men and to women and to people of color and, um, you know, that kind of thing, which I think definitely... Um, sound and aesthetic and everything about presentation 
is is baked into that too, you know? And hard edge country or soft country, you know, pop leanings or in a contemporary sense, R&B leanings or hip hop leanings, all of that is played out differently. I mean, you could have, you know, like Patsy Cline is, an, is a whole other interesting case study. There, there's so many different interesting case studies. Yeah, that's a whole other, that's seven more books for you to write right there. Piling them up, next, next Leanne Rhymes, and then... <laughs> Break. <laughs> Coming to you. Um, one of the more striking things reading your book was you're naming all of these experiences with gender bias in the industry that, like, as someone who has been around it on the, in the publishing world, I've experienced and heard almost verbatim, but it was kind of forbidden to speak about because if you talked about it, then you were difficult and you'd never work in Nashville again. How did you get past that interviewing these women and what barriers did you encounter to this kind of culture of, you know, shut up and sing that Nashville very much has? Yeah, I mean, that was a really weird thing I realized, ex like, I don't, I guess maybe I thought that existed, um, because it exists to some degree in every walk of life. Um, but I realized very quickly how much that was part of, like, the Nashville, even, like, the media ecosystem here. Like, as a journalist, I, like, after being here for a couple months, I realized, like, oh, you're with the exception of like pretty much, you know, Julie here and a handful, like, you know, five other reporters, everyone else kind of like just ask questions about like puppies, you know, like I go to like, a, I go to like a media round table or something like that, which I don't go to anymore. <laughs> and, and the question, choice. That's yeah. a good choice. <laughs> I stopped that pretty early on and they'd go around and the reporters would literally ask questions, you know, hey, like, you know, pass the mic and they get to the reporter and they'd be like, oh man, like how's the new baby? And that was your one question. And you know, or like saw the pictures of the new puppy on Instagram or like, you know, and I started to see this over again and realized that I was supposed to be, um, my role there was to be nice and play part of the family. Um, and I didn't really like that, you know, not out of a way that like I wanted to be um, difficult on purpose, I just, that wasn't real, that wasn't the truth. And I went to the CMA Awards, my very first CMA Awards. Um, and I can't remember, the I guess the first or second year after I moved to Nashville. And I was in the press room, so I saw this like kind of super magnified and it was really bizarre. And uh, so I wrote a little bit of like a kind of from live, you know, live from the press room piece. And it was a little bit snarky, I guess. I'm not usually super snarky, but the whole experience was really ridiculous. And then they banned me from the CMA awards. <laughs> I remember that. I'm glad you told yeah. that story. Um, <laughs> Did you get unbanned though? I had to wait for, for three people to leave the CMA. Um, there were three people that worked there that once all three of them had finally left, I got unbanned. Congratulations. But, thank you. You outlasted them. I outlasted them. Um, I don't really want to go. Um, but yeah, and that applied to the CMA, uh, CMA Fest too. So um, that was interesting. Um, but yeah, I realized very quickly like what the stakes were there. And that's just as a journalist. So like, what's it like for a person who's actually an artist, uh, um, you know, works in publishing, works at, at one of the labels. Um, and I guess like I chose in that moment to like, I knew what I, my role was gonna be. But, like, I wasn't gonna care if like eventually I couldn't work anymore um because i didn't want to work under rules where i had to say what you're supposed to say all the time um that doesn't feel very worthwhile um and i think a lot of the women that i talked to in this book and some of the men too you know feel that way and um i look towards their careers and how they operate in that way that they you know it feels worth 
speaking out to them at whatever costs might come, I guess. But a lot of times, you know, it's, I think a lot of them, and I've seen this in the past year, a lot of artists, I think a lot of female artists have realized that why am I, why am I silencing myself? I'm never gonna get on country radio. So I'm just gonna start saying the truth. Um, and it's been interesting to see from like a, a certain group of like kind of more mainstream country uh, women specifically who were kind of really, a couple of them I had like interviewed before and ended up even tabling their interviews because they were so nervous to speak that they just gave me um, talking points. I'm usually pretty good at getting past the talking points, but in this case they were like, they would not stray. And I was like, well, I'm just not, you know, I can't really run that. Um, because they're so terrified, you know, it's so drilled in you not to say anything, you don't wanna mess up. Um, and I think a lot of them are starting to say, I'm never gonna get that number one song, so like, I'm gonna say what I believe. And that's really exciting, I think, to see. When I worked in the country music industry, it was the 80s and 90s. And there was no problem with women on country music uh, radio. I mean, we had Mary Chapin Carpenter, we had Pam Tillis, we had um, a lot of the KT Oslin <laughs> on, on country radio. What has changed? And why has it changed? I have a book for you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to give the short version of that. Um, the short version of that question, that's a tough one. There are a lot of things that change. Um, I mean, and that's the question that I, not to like try to like chill market my own book here, but like that is authentically the question that I wanted to address in the book because a lot of people have asked me that, like, cause that's what people remember. Like, I remember hearing all these women on the radio and they were really good songs and good songwriting and what, you know, what the hell happened? Um, and this, the most like shortest, weirdest condensed version of that, um, I think starts with the Telecommunications Act, 1996, leading into consolidation of, of country radio stations, you know, massive consolidation against, uh, in the industry in general um, which led to these reliance on automated programming in which you can actually program to separate women out. You know, you, pro you tag women's songs, so you play them less. Up against 9-11, shift to, you know, super patriotic, jingoistic programming. Faith Hill ballads don't sound so good. Up next to sticking a boot in a terrorist's ass. Um, and then you come into what happened to the chicks. There's fear around women's voices and agency. Um, and a lot of people will say, oh, it's bro country that killed women on country radio. And I don't, that's not true. That, that's just kind of the symptom of where we ended up from all this. I mean, it certainly didn't help, but it's not what did it, you know? And um, that's kind of the most condensed version of that that I can give. <laughs> A lot of different things, yeah. I have a very loud mouth. <laughs> Thank you. So I am listening to your book. And today was the first time I heard payola. And then I heard about Casey being charged for a $500 bottle of wine by a radio producer and just the, all the things that, you know, you're saying the quiet part out loud. So thank you, but I also bought the book because I don't want to miss a thing. No. I'm just telling you that I, when you listen, you start doing other things, and you know I'm from that generation where you multitask, and I don't even have kids. I can't imagine that level of multitasking. <laughs> but my question is, I really love the, the inclusive part where you talk about how these artists, these women artists, don't care who you are, what your background is, what your what's your sexual preference, anything, what color your skin, they don't care about that. And the great writers get together and how they accept everybody together. And I love that part of it. So was that intentional to show that these women are accepting even if this industry 
wasn't as accepting as they should have been back to them. Was that intentional? For sure, for sure. Um, I mean, and even kind of, uh, I guess I did a lot of like even self interrogation when I was putting together the book and asking myself questions of, um, about when I, you know, could have had a more intersectional view about my own work um, in making sure I accomplished that and showing kind of the broadest picture of country music possible. Um, and kind of in highlighting, and especially as I went through and kind of chose the moments that I wanted to highlight, because you have 20 years, you have three women, you have all these other women, you can't, a lot gets left out. Um, but the moments that I picked kind of were in service of that in showing just how um, how broad a country music fan base can be and is and what happens when you kind of try to crack open people's impression that country music is one thing or their intentional moves to keep country music one thing um, which is usually very white and male with the exception of like one blonde female um, and that's how I kind of chose the moments in the book, like, you know, Casey singing Follow Your Arrow and bringing up her, you know, Shay McAnally and Brandy Clark or, um, you know, Marin, um, you know, releasing a song in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests or like um, Mickey kind of being part of, you know, kind of spearheading this whole movement to open the door for other black female artists. And that's, that was sort of my lens that I, used to choose a lot of the moments that I highlighted in the book that were kind of in service of um, just kind of cracking open what we think of as being country music and who is let in to the world of country music. I think we've got one more time for one more question or Joe. All right. Um, I, I'll mention to your question, there's some really wonderful moments about communities that build up around the artists when they arrive and are songwriting and hang out in, what is the, uh, the apartment? The, the hotel villa. The hotel villa. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, so much to Marissa and Julie for joining us. Thank, thank you, Julie. Um, thank, you, thank you for joining us, uh, for spending your Thursday night with us. Uh, here at the State Museum. Please do come back. We're open between 10 and 5 uh, every day except Monday, 1 to 5 on Sundays. Come back, visit the galleries, uh, keep an eye on our website for more uh, TN Writers, TN Stories events. Uh, we have lunchtime lectures, lots of different events, and our temporary show right now is called Painting the Smokies, and it's a really fantastic show about the four decades leading up to the uh, designation uh, of a national park. So. Thank you all. Um, if you brought a book, or if you bought a book or brought a book to be signed, I, I think we had a table, but Marissa, it's up to you if you want to just sign them here or uh, something less formal. Wonderful. Come, come back and see us. Thank you so much. <laughs>